really thank all the people that have held me in this space as I've gone through this process of immersing myself in the welcoming prayer. Because the welcoming prayer is what saved my life. My son died five years ago. And um, when that happened, it was very difficult for me to continue living. I mean, it's a hard thing to lose someone you love. And um, this practice, I came to this practice in that time and it made all the difference. And I took the practice and embodied it with um, brain dance, with a practice that bodies the mind, body, spirit. And together, it's really saved my life. So that's why I'm here doing this. And let's go right into the wonderfulness of today. So the welcoming prayer. The welcoming prayer is a practice that's embodied and it comes from contemplative outreach. So contemplative outreach Hawaii is hosting this, this presentation today. But it comes from contemplative outreach. This isn't a practice I made up. This is a practice that I'm presenting from somewhere from contemplative outreach's practices. It comes from Father Keating. It comes from Mary Murawski. It's, it's not mine. I am embodying it and presenting it to you from there. So I am not an expert. I am a person who loves this prayer and lives this prayer. And today we're going to do this. So this prayer, I see this as the companion, one of the many companions to centering prayer in my life. So this prayer is consent on the go, is how we refer to this prayer, the welcoming prayer. And here in this picture, you can see heading down the road, going down through life, things might happen. They may come up. Here, I have an open road. This is the po old Pali road for those of you on Oahu. And I'm going down this road and any minute here, there's gonna be a sharp turn and someone's gonna come around and they're going to be on the wrong side. And I'm gonna have a moment to respond to that. And it's, 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 you know, we're going really slow. There's no real huge danger, but I get, can get very upset in that moment. The other is on this road, sometimes people are going really, really, really slow, even slower than me. And they're in front of me and I can take the opportunity to bless them and be in the moment and welcome all that I'm feeling in this moment with the welcoming prayer. So who's in the driver's seat when we're, when we're driving? Is it you? Is it me? Is the divine indwelling with you? And that's my, my hope, is that by consenting to God's presence and action in the ordinary daily life occurrences, that the divine indwelling is with me. Throughout this time, you are welcome to, to put questions in the chat. Um, and I'll respond to them as I can. But if you think of something that you want to know as we go through this presentation today, um, you don't have to hold on to it. You can put it in the chat so that you don't have to remember it till later. So who am I? Well, I am, I am a, a one person who is part of the human condition. And today's we're going to talk a lot about the human condition. Um, you're going to see a bunch of pictures pop up here that are all about me. And I started Centering Prayer in 1996. I was introduced to it actually as a, at a morning of prayer at Central Union Church on Oahu and um, by a wonderful person who took me aside and said, oh, here, let me introduce you to Centering Prayer. And then I went to some retreats and learned and started centering all the time. I was fortunate enough to be there when Father Keating came in 2000 to actually do this practice with him up there at St. Anthony's Retreat Center. The welcoming prayer I first learned in 2010 at a, contempl at a Contemplative Outreach Hawaii's retreat from Gail Fitzpatrick Hopler. And then, and in that year, my mom died. And this prayer really came into my body. Grief is a big part of life and why the welcoming prayer is so important to me. And then I was fortunate enough, we had other presentations by John and Carol over in 2003 and 2016 in workshops. And then 2016 is when my son died. 
And that's when I knew that this practice was the practice for me that I needed to live this and wanted to go through the process of presenting it to people. And that's a process which means first I became a presenter for Centering Prayer and then over time here for Welcoming. So now I'm going to give you an opportunity to find out who else is here. Everyone bounces back into the room. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. It's like, you know, a kaleidoscope of beautiful faces. So lovely to have you all here. Now, Terry, I know you came right in and went right into a room. Good job. <laughs> a friendly person, trusting that that all worked well for you. So excellent. Nice to have you all here. So if you would like to, in the chat, put your name and where you're from or some other little bit of information about yourself so that I get to see it, that would be just delightful. <laughs> and now we're going to go on and talk about some of the people who are not here but that are really part of this practice. So one is Mary Morawski. Mary Morawski, did I say it right this time? I may have. Um, is the creator and the spiritual mother of the welcoming prayer practice. She, with residents from the Chrysalis House, developed this practice um, for prayer, for, for life on the go, for when we're in everyday life, we, at least me, I really need to have prayer embodied and prayer that takes advantage of who I am and where I am in the moment in this moment, because as much as I love centering prayer and carry that silence with me, there's a whole lot of life that isn't silent um, and that I'm actively involved in. And from Father Keating, so these two people are the, the reason why we have this prayer and practice. And I love this statement that Mary's bonding with God became so exuberant that everything she's doing is a prayer. I mean, my gosh, isn't that the highest of all compliments? Everything we're doing, and I believe everything we're doing is a prayer. So what? why are we here today? What? What is this all about and why are we here? We're, we're going to be talking about the welcoming prayer. But our task for me, the big part of this is finding all those barriers within myself that keep me from being with the divine and dwelling, that keep me from the, the true source of love. And how are we gonna do this today? Well, today's agenda, we're gonna talk about the human condition. So this is Father Keating's work. We're gonna go into this into some detail. You're gonna have some time to chat about it with your friends. We're gonna go in depth into the welcoming prayer practice and we'll have lots of time to practice it will really be in, in this. When we talk about the challenges and resistance as they're embodied, we will have more opportunities for the welcoming prayer throughout that time. And we will close with our gifts and the benefits of the welcoming prayer practice, as well as giving you ideas of how you can get support to keep that practice going in your everyday life. So, who are we, our human bodies? So this is a poem from Rumi that um, is very indicative of the human practice and the human beings. And I'm gonna have Margie unmute herself and read this for us. I'm gonna unmute you, Margie, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be cleaning you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Welcome and entertain them all. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Thank you. 
Thank you, Margie. And now I'm going to give you just a moment. Again, you're going to have just a couple of minutes in your rooms to just reflect on that for just you're going to have two minutes. If you who would like to share any of your impressions in the chat, again, I welcome you to share things in the chat because I don't get to hear you when you go into the rooms, but hopefully this is bringing this work to, to your total being. Oh, yes. So that conscious, that unconsciousness, all of those things that are our beings. So our bodies are this warehouse of the unconscious. Now, today is September 11th, and it's, it's a day that the whole world remembers. And they remember them in, it, it in different ways. There's, there's some beautiful art out there that looks at the whole world crying on this day. But for people in the United States in particular, this is a day where there can be deep grief still felt throughout the nation, felt in the body of the people, just as things that happen in your life are in your body. So the things that have happened to you throughout your life are there and often it's unconscious. I feel things in my body, tightness here, there, grief. Oftentimes when things get brought up for me, I notice them in my body and I feel them. And there's all of this body. So you see my beautiful Haku and you see this beautiful island. And we in the islands are very familiar with islands and we know that there's 20,000 feet of island below that surface. And that is what we're looking at, this unconsciousness, this part that happens to us that's, this is from a beautiful local artist painting who's given me permission to use this here. And it is just an amazing thing what's below the surface and how do we feel that and embody that in our daily life. The experiences are carried in the cells, they're imprinted there. The welcoming prayer will be will, helps heal these wounds of a lifetime by addressing them where they are stored in the body. It's an embodied and enfleshed practice. This body, this warehouse of the unconscious, it's the container for all kinds of things that are unresolved, repressed emotional things of a lifetime. They're in our body below the surface. So Father Keating's work about basic human needs, there's energy centers. What are these energy centers? Well, one is security, survival, and safety. And so as a very young child, this is my grand niece who's four months old, um, and she has these really basic needs, and we all do. We have these really basic needs when we came in and they stay with us, and hopefully they get to a level that makes sense to our, as we mature. And there's um, the basic need of affection and esteem, connecting to each other, the people in your life that you love, that you know, all of those impressions and places and spaces. And there's the power and control, empowerment, which is part of everything. I don't know about you, but this is the one that I regularly identify with. Um, so our instinctual needs are God-given because of our perceived or real deprivations, sometimes we overreact and they're not fully satisfied. These three energy centers begin at this early point in life. And the trouble is, is as we mature, and if we're lucky, we get to the age of reason, which Father Keating thought happened at the age of 14 or 15, we might use our rational facilities then to justify or glorify or rationalize what's, what we're doing in our life to try to still satisfy these really basic early on needs. The power of our unconscious motivations, it's linked to these basic human needs that are present in all of us. These basic human needs, security, affection, control. You'll hear this over and over again throughout this practice. Instinctual, God-given, we're born with them, 
They're wonderful. We, we need them. They keep us motivated, but they can also become overwhelming. So Father Keating uses this term, the false self. And the false self represents when we repress or we inappropriately express these feelings later in life, where we become overwhelmed and need for one of these that then takes over. Um, cultural conditioning, group over identification can reinforce and support this false self. So contemplative movements in practice, prayer infuses and permeates the actions. Contemp contemplation at its worst or best can be barren and aggravated and action without contemplation, sorry, action without contemplation <laughs> can be just godless. We need this contemplation. We need to be able to connect, connect to the contemplative state. So this is, oh, this is my least favorite diagram. <laughs> this diagram is a diagram created by uh, Father Keating that talks about this process and it has numbers. And I'm going to, to explain this diagram with the words from Father Keating. So, and, and explain each one of the numbers and how we all kind of feed into each other with this. The motivations for many of our actions grow out of the false self system, our unconscious childish programs for happiness generated by this energy center, this emotional programs for happiness. On a conscious level, our motivations are synonymous with our intentions, but on an unconscious level, our pure intentions and motivations are laced with our desire for security affection and control. So on this chart, number one here, this energy centers, this emotional programs for happiness. Um, they're located in this triangle, security, affection and control. And they're the unconscious programs that then as we mature, they are part of our unconscious and they move into our everyday life. And we, that happens in the form of attractions and aversions. And then it can tap into these hidden agendas. What do we think we're trying to do and how might we do that? A triggering event might happen, which brings about frustration and upset. And if we're lucky at 5A, we might have a practice that could break that cycle. But for me, typically, I then go right on to my emotions. I have this internal dialogue that justifies what I'm doing. Um, I go through all these things and it reinforces my needs for power and control, security, affection, and esteem. So all of these things. So what's another way to look about the formation of the false self? We have these programs for happiness we talked about. All right, those happen in early childhood. Then as life goes on, we have coping behaviors that develop. I need to make sure I always have enough to eat. I need to know that I am safe. And we have various mechanisms. I need to know I'm in control. And you know yours. You've developed ways to make sure those happen for you. Then we have our social group. Now we need affection and esteem, but sometimes people pleasing, the wanting people's esteem, it becomes more important. We over identify and we sacrifice our own needs and desires for the benefit of the good. And then there's cultural baggage. So for me in particular, this cultural baggage, I always went, what, like, what, is, what are they talking about? And then I read books about, um, I'm a white woman, lives in Hawaii, um, I'm comfortable. I have all these things that I come in, white privilege. I have things that I'm privileged, not because of the money I have or anything else, but just because of what I look like. And I'm an, a senior now. And there's a whole bunch of privileges that happen just because of what I look like in the world. People will help me without being asked. Um, people will do all kinds of things that this is part of my who I am. And that's also part of my cultural baggage because it, it filters the world. I think everybody gets treated like I do. I see the whole world through my eyes. Now I know enough to know that that is not true, but it's very difficult to know it on a, on a deep level for me. So we've talked about the false self, the false self, the center of gravity, the false self is the self, those energy centers. The true self is about God, about that connection where you're drawn to God. When you're in your true self, 
the gravity, the pull of God is strong. Now, what strikes you about the formation of the false self? What is this? Now, this is not an easy concept. And those of you who've been through Centering Prayer have heard of this before. Some of you may have read these books. Some of you may be experts on all of this. But for others, it may be new. So you're going to have three minutes to speak with each other about what strikes you about this false self. How lovely. Was that good enough? You had enough time to kind of excellent. Excellent. I give you an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, so here we go. I hope this is helpful for you. I find being able to talk about it a little bit really helps me as I go along learning these things. So the false self, it's a monumental illusion, a load of habitual thinking patterns and emotional routines stored in the brain and the nervous system. So I really, the nervous system is part that I really connect to and I find embodying it by actually wiggling a little bit really is helpful to me. And I have, I don't know about you, but there are a gazillion things in life that happen to me that I get triggered into this place where I'm responding to things, I'm reacting to what's going on as if someone has pressed a giant on my triggers, triggering events. What are triggering events? Look, let's look at these and, and how, well, how triggering events fit into this whole process. So our, we have desires, aversions, things that are, are, that we like and want, and they are what are triggered by the triggering event. And also our triggering events are partially, what would be a trigger for us is linked to this this what are things you're attracted to what are things that you are averted from now when our frustrations happen when we've been triggered um maybe in there you have a moment for an embodied pause to consent to god's presence and action but typically not for me typically you know when i'm lucky i i do this but usually i spend one full round going through a a series of emotions. I put a whole bunch of them on here for you so that you can find at least one that might be for you. But I find that I get triggered and when I get triggered then various things come up for me. And they come up. Now often then if I am lucky I can then take another minute and engage in my welcoming prayer practice which can then put this in this place. It doesn't get rid of what I'm feeling but it brings in the divine indwelling. It allows the divine indwelling to be with me. I still have all of these feelings and sensations. Some may get resolved, some may not. Other things may come up for me that, that they resolve into other issues, but maybe not. It may just be that I'm in this place that I know that I have the divine indwelling, the divine presence that's with me, I acknowledge it. So, what are ways that I know that I am in, triggered? So there's, there's things that are clear, there are emotions, but there's also the embodied part. So I get a pain in my neck and maybe you get pains in your neck too. And often it is from something that is irritating to me, that is a trigger um, or a headache. And, and which again, when I get overwhelmed by things and I can't quite process them or live with them or welcome them in my being, here I am a, a Hawaiian person standing with my back to the ocean, which is not something that's recommended. And that itself can trigger me to where I don't even know, I didn't even realize that I'm being triggered by the environment around me. Back pain, I'm carrying the world's problems around. I see that this is happening. Um, a, a tummy ache the now that place between your rib cage and your pico you feel this here so margie would you like to read this for us i'm now unmuting you margie <laughs> i'll try again the false self is a monumental illusion a load of habitual thinking patterns 
and emotional routines that are stored in the brain and nervous system. Thank you. That's wonderful. So now you, you guys have got it. You got it down now. You know I'm going to let you go again and talk about how do you know you're being triggered? How do you know you're entering the frustration zone for yourself? What does this mean for you? So it's always so much fun. Excellent. So we're going to go on our merry way into the things that might be even more significant than triggers. Um, so this is a this is Paul was was a quote from Paul to the Romans. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. How many of you can identify with this? Raise your hand. Excellent. So I don't even need to speak to it. You understand it. We do things that we don't understand why we do them. Now there's there's things that we get triggered and then we have these emotional responses, but then there's like systemic things like I was raised by addict alcoholics and then of course I married them even though it was really not something I wanted in my life. Um, there's these things that we do that we look back on our life and we go, why did I do that? And again, you know, it's a mixed bag. We have some of both going on. We have our true self, our false self. All of these are, things are happening. We don't need to beat ourselves up, but knowing it and recognizing it and seeing it as an opportunity to consent to God's presence and action in our life is so important. So this Apostle Paul poignantly captures the human dilemma in this famous passage from Romans. The split between intentions and actions seems to be a universal human experience. We intend one thing and we do another. Intention implies a choice, a conscious aim or purpose towards something. Living intentionally means living with a deliberate purpose in mind, paying attention to whether or not we're keeping our intentions moment by moment. However, like Paul, we may intend to act as God's instruments of peace and love in all of our actions and interactions, yet we may find it difficult to carry that out. What gets in our way? Well, I, you know, the biggest one is when things let it in, get in our way. Margie, would you like to read this for me? I'm unmuting you now. Yes, to, to welcome and to let go is one of the most radically loving, faith-filled gestures we can make in each moment of each day. It is an open-hearted embrace of all that is in ourselves and in the world. Mary Morosky. So we'll just take a moment now, close your eyes for just a moment and feel and sink into your body. Just feeling your body in this place and in this space and in this time. We've, we've, we've experienced a lot. And let's welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today because I know it is for my healing. I welcome thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. And I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, 
person or myself. I open to the love and presence of God and God's action within. I just needed to say that prayer there for a moment. And we're going to go into in-depth look at this prayer, but I just needed it right then. So thank you for being with me. The divine indwelling is here with us all the time, surrounding us, around us, with us. And when I look at this process, all these things we've talked about today, we have our energy centers. We have all the things that happen in life. And you can see for me, the triggering events are kind of most of life feels like anyways. And then there's all the responses that I happen. My bodily responses are the things I notice first because that's what I'm like. And oftentimes the responses are long. The internal dialogue, that committee in your head, the emotions that might come up, frustrations. And for me, when I'm in the right place, taking a moment to bring in the welcoming prayer, in any of these places, this, this helps me understand this practice and how to do this. So again, why are we doing this? If holiness is being close to God, then the process of holiness is where God changes our attitudes towards the trials and tribulations in our life. And the good news is, you know, the human condition is an evolutionary process. Humans respond to reality. It includes our conscious intentions and motivations, as well as our unconscious motives rising from the energy centers. Good news is it also includes our fundamental goodness and potential for unlimited development into the higher states of consciousness. The welcoming prayer is a practice that helps us to embrace the indwelling spirit in every moment of daily life, to let go of the thoughts and feelings that support the false self system and to respond in love to any person or situation. So we're gonna take time for a little bio break here um, and if anybody has any questions and they want to stay for a minute or two, you can do that. But otherwise, I encourage you to go on a bio break and I'll see you on the hour.